Good morning once again to our wonderful, albeit small, crowd of data analysts and data minded individuals. All are welcome, regardless of whether you like the data or you like some of the news stories which are going to be coming up. We have some really, really good uh, stories coming up. Let me show you real fast. We're going to come back to news in a second. The Dream Team, scientists find drug duo that make cure COVID-19 together. Uh, athletic competition after COVID-19. How to obtain immune bovine milk, strengthen the body against COVID-19. Prior COVID-19 infection reduces infection for up to 10 months. New study into green tea's potential to help tackle COVID-19. Again, I have to read these are a wonderful lineup this week. A lot of great research. Gene protection for COVID-19 identified. I mean, that we covered last week that we're going to play into that. And Mason scientists explore herbal treatment for COVID-19. It is really, really an incredible, incredible week for basically research in reference to COVID-19, as you can get the idea. But first, we're going to look at this. We're going to collect our data right now. I was trying to compile the database, and we'll get to the, the news stories in a second, so then you could drop off if you don't want to get into the data. But however, this is what we're looking at. I was compiling the database in reference to the average age in the vaccine adverse event report you know, over the seven days. And this is basically, if you notice here, the average age was 55 around this area, 45 here. And then as we began to vaccinate uh, younger and younger individuals, obviously the adverse event reports began to go lower and lower in reference to the average age. Now, however, though, we have an issue. And I'm going to lead with Gavin Newsom's quote for the week. And this is going to have a strong tie-in because Gavin Newsom, no matter if, whether he may not recognize it or not, but his quote was quite prophetic in reference to our data collection. Now, here we go. Newsom, California Governor Gavin Newsom reneges on surrendering emergency powers. Now, this Boolean logic, albeit will probably be Use as an example in many logic classes, philosophical and computer as well, because it is Boolean logic to the nth degree as a great example of how what may be an equal may not be an equal, or maybe an equal or equal, or whatever it is, however you want to do it, modus polo, modus totem, however it goes down to be. But here it goes. You ready? Quote, the one thing I am certain of is there is uncertainty in the future said Newsom. Now keep in mind, what is the one statement that we've made quite often in many of these videos, I think this is the 34th week we've been doing this, is the danger in weaponizing uncertainty. Now what Newsom did here was weaponize uncertainty in the most eloquent of fashions. Because what is he saying? He's certain of uncertainty Therefore, the emergency remains in effect after June 15th because I don't know if he's mitigating against COVID-19 or if he's trying to protect us from a world of uncertainty. So again, that's for you to decide. I'm sure this will make the news probably the next few days or so. But however, though, not to misquote him at all, but however, though, again, uh, I'm not going to formulate an opinion one way or the other, just quoting what the guy said. If you can make sense of it, albeit please do but to proceed as follows how this quote comes into play is this this is the most dis disturbing event of the week not what he has said but this now why is this disturbing and i'm only going to cover this real fast so i keep on refreshing the page hoping it comes back up the VAR system the vaccine adverse event reporting system is the primary surveillance system to where if there is a problem with the batch, a lot number, or some other issue, which could be um, unintended, the first place that would normally show up is the vaccine adverse event reporting system. Let's say you get sick from a vaccine. Even then, where are you supposed to report that uh, reaction to the vaccine? The vaccine adverse event reporting system. Let's say you have a child that gets sick. Well, let's have multiple children that get sick from a certain vaccine. Where are you supposed to make that report? Here. It's kind of like the 911 system for vaccine reports. But however, though, from what I can tell, the VAERS adverse report, the event reporting system has been down since June 3rd. And this is the Wayback Machine for those that are not familiar. Um, you can go back and look at websites and pull up pages the last time they were operational. It stays a snapshot. Snapshot. And if you saw that quick glance right there, 
I'll show you that towards the end. That would be like a bonus thing. It has nothing to do with pandemic mitigation, but it has a wonderful uh, effect of um, basically eroding your trust in in our national security. But proceed. But to proceed. All right. So basically, that's what's happened. Now, in my humble opinion, and again, not a professional epidemiologist or anything along those way, along those lines is if your main surveillance system for finding out if an issue occurs with a batch lot number or other is down, then the wholesale inoculation of your general population, especially younger individuals, should be halted until your surveillance system comes back up. This has been down now since, I guess, June 3rd. It is now 12.43 a.m. June 6th, and it's not up. I'm hoping it comes back up soon. And once it does, then we can review this data uh, more in detail to see the trends, so on and so forth, um, to give it an idea. And the most disturbing part about this is this. Part of the hypothesis of why it may have went down is because we are experiencing, as we showed last week, this is all the vaccine adverse event reports that need to be investigated. This is all the vaccine adverse events that were reported in 2020, the whole of the year. This is just up to May 28th. So let's get right into the research and data as follows and really cool stuff. So the dream team, scientists find drug duo the May, I cannot say the word often because I did actually once, I'll say it again, the May cure, May cure, COVID-19 together. Quote, vaccines aren't 100% effective. Da -da. So they want to make sure, that, and plus the fact is there's mutations and the shift and this drift and this so on and so forth. And there's people for a while that were making homemade vaccines and the early issue is part of this, if you would search hard enough, you would find them. Uh, disturbing things like that, they could have caused mutations or variants to rise. But to the study that these guys did. Now keep in mind too, uh, all this information, if you don't, have, you don't have to catch it the first time, will be linked on the YouTube site, so you can follow it on your own. And please forgive me if I butcher the pronunciation of these medications, but they are medications. But however, let's begin. Uh, Cefaranthine, cef cefaranthine inhibited the entry of the virus into cells by preventing the virus from binding to a protein on the cell membrane, which it uses as a gateway. In contrast, nefilnavir work to prevent the virus from replicating inside the cells. So you see what the researchers did there. They said, wow, this does this. And we'll just say Ceph does this and Nelf does this. What if we combine them? So we have like a one-two punch. By inhibiting a protein, the virus relies on replication. Given these drugs have distinct antiviral mechanisms, using both of them together could be especially effective for patients with computational models predicting that combined cefarothene and nephil nephilvir therapy can hasten the clearance of SARS-CoV-2 from a patient's lungs by as few by as few as 4.9 days. That is an incredible, incredible insight. Uh, again, links will be there for you to follow on your own. Uh, in a, I'd love to be able to see some human trials into this. This is basically the researchers are trying to uh, incorporate, uh, especially if they go for emergency approval. Heck, what the heck? It's you know, if the, something uh, breaks a vaccine's inoculation protection in the herd, whatever it is, you need these. Especially, too, is fact, you know, there could be always variants out there, and this just does an eloquent job. All right, we'll go to the next one. Next one as follows, athletic competition after COVID-19. Generally, these are the study findings. And this right here is the trial size, or I should say the um, observational model they utilize. But the bottom line is this, with athletic competition after COVID-19, and they were concerned about heart issues. Our results show that none of the athletes who went cardiac MRI had abnormal findings. Again, for the sake of time and expediency, I will have the link there. But right off the bat, the outcome from the observations is as follows, which is quite comforting for those concerned. Next, ba boom how to obtain immune bovine milk to strengthen the body against COVID-19. This is another ingenious route uh, as far as helping boost immunity. Physiological milk contains biocomponents that are highly protective against infections. In this light, 
the AGR1549 Infectious Disease Group at the University of Colorado, uh, Cordoba, sorry, not Colorado, please forgive me. Cordoba's Department of Animal Health is doing research and focus on cow's milk as a possible source of COVID-19 control. All right, there's a word that you don't get censored with. You say control. You say the other one, C-U-R-E. Yeah, let's see if our video makes it to the uh, the censors. The results show published, in par uh, published partially in the Journal of Frontiers in Immunology. Quote, this is possible due to cross immunity and is already evidence of protection it provides, explained one of the principal investigators. Wait till we get to the end. It gets really good. It has been shown that the immune cells that the vaccinated animal generates, you see what they're doing here. They're vaccinated the bovine and then the bovine lives. And then when the bovine lives, guess what's passed through to the colostrum, but to proceed. Capable of controlling the other coronavirus as well, such as SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19. The animals from which the milk is extracted have been previously vaccinated with commercial BCOV vaccines, thus generating high levels of antibodies. However, the time when milk is most effective is just after birth. Then the level of immunoglobulin in the milk increases, what is called colostrum. But it has a certain duration. And now here's the interesting part too. I like this because as you get to the bottom, you didn't realize you're already testing this on individuals. The dairy preparation, which anyone can consume, provided you're not allergic to dairy, <laughs> has already been tested on more than 300 people. Among them, no serious COVID-19 process has been detected. As soon as it goes on the market, an observational test will be carried out. As soon as it goes on the market, or basically, obviously, as soon as it hits the market, I should say. So that's really, that's really interesting because they're going to market it and then carry out the observations. It's colostrum. So chances are they can probably get away with it pretty easily. Observational tests will be carried out. In any case, it will not be harmful to health and could become a natural resource providing people with a certain level of immunity. Again, 300 individuals already consuming uh, basically this particular variant of immunoglobulin from colostrum. Links will be there for you. Pretty cool, simple. Again, I like using the word eloquent because you're actually using, in some aspects, nature to help. And in a way which probably may help with uh, greater variations or, for example, as which may be circulating you know, in the environment. But to proceed, now this is important, obviously, as well. Prior COVID-19 infection reduced infection risk for up to 10 months. Now, you remember we look at the, we'll go to the, the data analytics in a second, and you see this, this kind of like this peak, and it goes down, then a peak, and it goes down. Uh, this may explain it, but however, though, I want you to keep in mind, you see this, it says right here, infection risk up to 10 months. Well, that doesn't mean it stops at 10 months. That only means they did the study looking at previous infection for up to 10 months earlier. So it could go beyond that. There could be, so basically it's it's equal to or greater than, if you want to speak in a, a mathematical Boolean sense. So infection risk equal up or greater than 10 months. The risk of being infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 is substantially reduced for up to 10 months following a first infection. According to new findings, da 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 because October and February among the 2,000 care home residents they looked at, so looked at again, long-term care facilities and the staff as well. And last week we covered, I think it was three articles in reference to natural immunity carrying out for quite some time. And now this is the fourth confirming article, observational, albeit. They found that residents with a previous infection were 85% less likely to be infected during this four month period than residents who had never been affected. Obviously we're going to a point here. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. While staff with past infection were 60% less likely than staff who had not had the infection before. The research said this showed strong protection in both groups. Now let's go down to how many actually became infected. Yeah, after the first infection. Here we go. The number of staff and residents who are reinfected between October and February was very small. Based on the antibody test results, remember there's antibody in T-cells too now. So keep in mind, they're now looking at T-cells as well as antibodies. 
We found a lot of people that had low antibody, uh, uh, basically, or results still had protection because of the T cells, but we covered that last week. Out of the 634 people who had been previously infected, reinfections occurred in only four of the residents and 10 members of the staff. So which is kind of interesting uh, because you're actually looking at a long-term care facility and generally, well, you get to break it down. 682 residents, the average age of 86, uh, or median age of 86, I should say, and 1,429 staff. So you can work the percentages out that way. Among the 1,477 participants who had never been affected, positive PCR results occurred in 93 residents and 111 staff. So there's your comparison. The study excluded the impact of vaccination, important, by removing participants from analysis of 12 days following the first vaccination dose. An important next step is to investigate the duration of immunity following natural infection and vaccination to assess whether this is a protective effect is maintained against the current and emerging variants. So you're going to see a competition here between those which had natural exposure and those which were vaccinated. So when they do the study to see how the vaccine group works in the future, I'll be really interested to see that and to see what wins, natural immunity or vaccine-related immunity, inoculation. So that's going to be really curious to see. So let's keep this in mind as far as links in the future. Next. Do, 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 do. New study into green tea's potential to help tackle COVID-19. I like them. All right, now you're going to see here, uh, you'll see statements like nature's oldest pharmacy has always been a treasure, potential novel drugs, da, 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 da. All right, great. The public release here is wonderful, but even better is actually the full study itself. And let's delve into that a few seconds. Here we go. All right, whoops, starting at the bottom. Let's, it's like what, reading the end of the book first. But here we go. Do, 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 do. All right, I want to look show you, show you the charts right here as far as what we have. All right, so this is this is intriguing. All right, so here we're looking at Gallo Cottage and Galley. And you see it basically like tea extracts and so on and so forth. And here's Remdesivir. This is Remdesivir. All right. There is its score as follows, you know, as you're reading through here. And you see a lot of them actually outperform them. Now, going down here, here's your Gallo Cottage and Galliot again. And here is your Remdesivir. Remdesivir again. It's 12.55 a.m. Remdesivir. All right. And look, it just kicks butt on the medication. You're talking green tea. Now, obviously, the dosaging and the amount consumed may have to be a little different as time moves forward and maybe, you know, a lot. Uh, but regardless, it still kicks butt and it's been consumed, which, again, epidemiologists out there, the, you know, in Asia and places like that, I mean, the infection rates are so much lower uh, in areas, for example, that we would expect to be much higher. And you have to look at the dietary considerations as well. What if it's just something simple in the diet that's being consumed that's protecting individuals from uh, the ravages of SARS-CoV-2? Why not? Why is no one really looking into that except if researchers here and there? And outside of that, what do we cover? 34 weeks, 34 weeks of potential profound treatments. Everything from 160 degree Fahrenheit heat to UV to ozonation to, you know, and how many have we seen incorporated after 34 weeks looking at the research? I don't think any of them have been incorporated into pandemic mitigation strategies. Any of them in the United States out of basically probably the tens of breakthroughs that have occurred. But to proceed. Do, 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 do. So we go down, da, 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 which is actually quite disturbing. But how are they go down here? Furthermore, it's reported, it goes into the cytotoxicity. Finally, they also found that EGCG treatment, epigallocatagallate, treatment decreased the levels of coronavirus, RNA, and protein in infected cell media. These results indicated that EGCG inhibits coronavirus replication. Another study, the polyphenol EGCG, exhibited significant effect on various druggable targets of SARS-CoV-2. The results suggest the potential activity of T polyphenols in the treatment of COVID-19. The use of T 
uh, phytoconstituents over synthetic drugs is an exciting treatment option since they are safer and higher doses are feasible. Again, links to the study, incredible breakthroughs uh, in reference to uh, bringing the you know, pandemic to an end. Actually, tons of incredible breakthroughs we cover continually, 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 continuously. Uh, but yet again, its incorporation into the bureaucratic drones is slow and painful. And the unfortunate part is that, which I mean, it, it may make light of it to some extent, but however, though, people's lives, livelihoods, as well as lives, are being greatly impacted by this really, this really, really poor reaction uh, to basically helping people overcome whatever obstacle is presented to us, especially in this viral medium. It's the person of viral vector. Proceed. Interesting as well. Gene protection for COVID-19 identified. Now, this is going to get really interesting because obviously a lot of people looking at potentially engineering a certain things and so on and so forth. We covered that way before that. When the first SARS-CoV-2 variant was found in what, February of 2019 in the sewage of Spain? Does not mean that it didn't occur naturally in the environment, but however, though, it could have been intercepted and then problems could have occurred from there. And that leads to speculation that has nothing to do with helping you, but this is important as far as basically protection. Because you try to, you start asking questions, why are certain people less susceptible than others? And here's one of those reasons. HLA DRB 104 colon zero one is found three times as often in people who are asymptomatic. Well, let's start here. The first evidence of a genetic link explaining why some people who catch COVID-19 don't become sick has been discovered. All right. All right. Maybe when the research, but we all know this is June 4th, last week, May 20th. So I don't know if it's the first, but darn close. And we'll cover this in a second too. So basically looking at this, there's three times as often people who are asymptomatic to proceed forward. It is known that the human leukocyte antigen gene identified as HLA DRB104 colon 01 is directly correlated to latitude and longitude. Interesting. This means more people in the north and west of Europe are likely to have this gene. Uh, this suggests that populations of European descent will be more likely to remain asymptomatic but still transmit the disease to susceptible populations. It could lead us to a genetic test which may indicate who we need to prioritize for future vaccinations. All right, I'll leave you to dwell on that on your own, but it's not the first. Remember last week we covered this. That basically, and it's not the same, HLA A24 colon 02, in which 60% of the Japanese individuals carry LL, which gives them protection somewhat, or resistance I should say, from COVID-19, which is interesting. So there are certain genetics which are quite common, it appears, in at least Asian and European descent at this point in time that seem to confer some sort of protection. Here, it creates an asymptomatic reaction. In the Japanese study, I think it may give uh, some sort of protection, or at least, dang it, that happened last week too, or in reference to um, uh, serious illness. But to proceed as follows, I'll carry the links here. Uh, that this one right here we did last week, so look at last week's video, and the link will be there. All right, next one. You ready for this? This one is just super exciting. And Mason scientists, well, all actually all exciting, but but this is really really cool too. All right, I mean I, I'm excited to give the research this week because it's not just for going into the negatives of the pandemic and those people are hurt and so on and so forth. All right, that's fine, but that's a downer. And we know there's been a lot of collateral damage and that we discussed quite a bit. But these are all light at the end of the tunnel research articles. And now all it requires is some sort of uh, intuitiveness or motivation, I should say, and to further pursue these fields into human trials and help people. But to proceed. Mason scientists explore the herbal treatment for COVID-19. Cell and bioscience recently highlighted research led by da, 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 potential anti-coronavirus activities of the over-counter over-the-counter drink. All right. Try to recall this word before we go into the full study. Respiratory detox shots. All right. You can't you can't make it sound any more commercial than that. 
RDS is a remedy containing nine herbal ingredients. It sounds so infomercial, but however, though, it has validity. Traditionally used in Eastern medicine to manage lung diseases. The research reported that RDS, respiratory detox shots, A, if it's simple, I don't care what they call it, but, it, it, it's, but if it works, beautiful. It says inhibited the infection of a targeted cells by SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 pseudoviruses and by infectious wild type SARS-CoV-2. The results suggest that RDS might broadly inhibit respiratory viruses such as influenza as well. Now, obviously, influenza A has always been a big concern as well. The study revealed that RDS contains very potent ingredients that can destroy the ineffectivity of SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, and influenza A viruses. Remember what was about 28 weeks ago when I got censored when I said the word destroy? Uh, influenza A, even at very low dosages, even at very low dosages, can be pers- to proceed. Said Wu, Professor Mason National Center for Biodefense, that's the Center for Biodefense. So I want you to reiterate that. This is not just like some people come with this to the garage and say, hey, take this over-the-counter drink, blah, blah, blah. you would be fine. This is from the Mason's National Center for Biodefense and Infectious Diseases. The investigators have demonstrated that RDS is effective against SARS-CoV-2 variants in vitro, meaning it has to be moved to VIVO. VIVO. <laughs> VIVO. And so they're going to check it out in Living organisms are most likely often more than not are going to be mice, but then they move to humans. But still, just the same, these are important. They need to be moved forward. But now the big question, what the heck is this respiratory detox shot to proceed? Here we go. This is the article. I'll have links for you as well. Ba ba ba. Went to the background. Cool grass. The respiratory detox shots, which contains nine ingredients. I will not attempt to pronounce them at this point in time, but here they are in the links before, before you to delve into on your own and look at the reasoning for why each one was chosen. But here is the respiratory detox shot combo, I should say. Now, as commercial and lighthearted as it sounds, it has some really serious kick butt effects on generally SARS-CoV-2 and other variants as well. As we can scroll down, we'll discover it. It says we basically tested it on the other variants. Uh, we further tested the RDS can also inhibit infection of SARS-CoV-2 variants. For this purpose, we took advantage of a recently developed hybrid alpha virus, the SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus, HACOV-2, and for the assembly of a series of S-protein variants, including the UK variant, South African variant, the Brazilian variant, the California variant, and the emerging variants, and HCOV-2, and the related S-protein variants were included with serially serially diluted RDS for one hour at 37 degrees centigrade. Subsequently, the mixture was used to infect da 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 targeted cells. Inhibition of viral infection was quantified. Right, we keep on going. Ba ba. As shown in the figure, we observed that respiratory Detox shot, I guess I can't call it anything else, dosage-dependent inhibition of HCOV-2, now here's the important part, and all the S-protein variants. That is just incredible. But proceed further down to the article. Again, the links will be there for you. Keep in mind, respiratory detox shot is RDS as proceed. For example, a common traditional Chinese medicine, herbal medicine, Licorice root uh, has been shown to contain uh, glycerin that inhibits the replication of uh, clinical isolates of SARS virus. In addition, as you can read through on your own, please forgive me for my pronunciation. This point in that time is probably not the best. But how it goes into the reasoning, each one of these particular constituents of this respiratory detox shot, why the hypothesis, or I should say conjecture per se, in a positive light, uh, was included into utilizing these particular herbs uh, that have been used for quite some time in traditional Chinese medicine uh, in reference to producing this RDS. But however, though, it's all there. It's all linked. The studies are done quite well. But however, though, it has to be carried out into living organisms in vivo. 
and eventually the human trials. Again, simple, very inexpensive methods that can possibly help with other variants and mutations in the future, as well as other things, uh, potential vectors, which we haven't even anticipated yet. This information like this is vital because before you can develop a vaccine, to have something like this readily available in the beginning, you may never even need to get to the point of having a mass inoculation if you have tools available that may help right from day one. Uh, they're here, they're there. And again, from UV light to heat to ozone to you know whatever uh, that we covered before, they work very well as far as mitigating a lot of the typical um, uh, air aerosolized viruses that are out there. But now to proceed to the data as follows. Oh, before I proceed to interesting aspect, this is the data also from various two. If you notice the data sets where they're supposed to be, still not coming up. And just we'll be looking at next week, we'll be pulling in data from here and looking at vaccine resistance. And look at this, France, 33%. See, a lot of times what happens is they tend to isolate the people which are not necessarily pro-vaccine or for a safe vaccine or reluctant to get a certain vaccine. In this case, for example, we just described before, they may get the flu shot, they may get tetanus, they may get this, but this one they're kind of hesitant on, especially a lot of healthcare workers. But know what? They're not alone. The United States, that's an amazingly high number, and that surprised a lot of individuals. And unless they get their act together and don't push certain emergency uh, authorized vaccines, which really have not been fully studied yet, uh, you have an interesting confounding where you have a backlash where trust is being eroded. And things like this don't build trust. All right, to the data itself. Here we are. I already covered this last week, and I showed you the vaccine reaction reports compared to 2020. Uh, now, keep in mind, too, only 1% of all the adverse events actually get reported to the VAERA system, according to the, uh, their data. So who knows what this actually is. But does not mean that every reaction is caused by a vaccine in the same light. And so that's also something that's to be taken into account in all fairness. All right, we looked at this. There was our word cloud, and that was for the uh, adults. Oh, or I should say, not the adults, all ages. That's the common symptoms. Uh, basically, that was from last week. We're just reiterating vaccine reports by age. As soon as they get updated data from the VARES, as soon as they fix their surveillance system, I'll re-update this, re-update this. It's like, now it's like, yeah, re-update. I'll update it. All right, there's that. Vaccine reaction by days, weeks, minors, and so on and so forth. Again, we stopped at May 20th. And is now June 6th, so it tells you how far behind we are in surveillance reports. This is in children. These are the, uh, or I should say younger, not children. Uh, underneath the age of, um, I think I quantified it underneath the age of uh, 18 or 19. Yeah, under the age of 19, actually 18 and younger, I should say, because it's not 19 or equal. And so there is the most common reports, and that's basically an easier to read layout. Most of the reactions being reported are cursory, but then again, you get so much required, uh, um, need greater investigation. And then what I started doing is I started combining the databases here, and then combining the databases with the uh, VAERS database, so we can, can look at the percentage of actual reactions compared to the number of people vaccinated in a certain day. And it doesn't look quite dramatic, but again, keep in mind, if only 1% of the VAERS reports are actually being reported, this could have a huge variance. And so, and then we conclude here with the average age until next week. All right, let's go to boom, 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 world data. We're gonna move this real fast. And what, one second, let me do them real fast. Let's look at our um, our Monte Carlo model to see if Monte Carlo model. And I'm gonna update this real fast and we'll come back to it to see if it um, if it changes at all. Let's see, it only went up to the 25th, but let's go to this first. All right, world data. This is the drop in cases. Now, often as a hypothesis with epidemics, they just collapse. All right, this is your deaths per million smooth. This is boom. Here we go. We we're noticing a very uh, similar slope. Uh, there we are there. New deaths per million on two different axes. 
Uh, mortality percentages, positive cases actually rose a little bit. And there's that. And as we go down, I'm going to move through real fast once we find information that's of uh, any interest. Uh, there is Sweden just collapsed. Just like, for example, here and here. And our Asian friends, what a reason. Uh, never really even touched the surface. Uh, USA, you know, boom. It's kind of funny because USA was actually lower for a while and then Sweden went into being lower. There is our new case of per million drop. That's Sweden, just like boom, went right, right down. All right, I'm looking at vaccine correlations. Nothing really out of the ordinary there. Um, let's go down. Taiwan, like the Taiwan didn't experience hardly anything. Look at this. This is basically new deaths, USA versus all of Asia. Uh, I believe that, know what that is? That is India. Look at that just slope, just all of a sudden just plummet. Again, it just, for whatever reason, correlation not wise, whatever, it's, everyone's worried about the Indian variant. It could be an exposure, a naturally acquired immunity to exposure to that variant, whatever it is. I'm not going to hypothesize. I'm just going to look at the data. Now, next week, we have real interesting to see exactly how fast that drops. It, it went up alarmingly fast, and then boom, went down. That's new deaths, USA versus all of Asia. All right, here we are. The ba, 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 it's going down the side here. India was closely catching up to the United States, even though its population is much greater. All of Asia versus the United States. Um, all of Asia total mortality, 704,118. For 4 billion 463 million people, USA mortality, 597,377, up to for a population of 329 million. And here's your percentages there. And work down, down, down. Again, that's an amazing drop. Correlations, heat maps, da da da, nothing fancy there, nothing fancy. Uh, vaccine percentages, that's uh, new deaths, new cases per million. Uh, Purple fully vaccinated. That's weird. It's, look, I'm looking at that chart now. That it was going. Now that's like that's paralleling each other now. Doesn't mean that's a vaccine failure or vaccines not protecting against the uh, variants. Because remember, the vaccines were made against a variant, which is, doesn't really it is hard to find, except for a few cases in Africa now. The original variant is, doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, so there's that going down. There is Asia, plummet. Uh, there is the cases. Let's see any further information that's out there. Please forgive me, I'm moving kind of fast. Nothing new, nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. There's Europe, a mortality per million. It's, you know, I don't think it's a state of emergency anymore, but that's just my opinion. I'm not in Europe, so again, I can't make judgments based upon their perception. Uh, cases of mortality. Uh, not, I mean, it's gone down dramatically, probably because of Britain, but otherwise it's good to world mask. Bum, bum, bum. All right. There is some adjustments here from Oxford University, but still this is superfluous as far as I don't think it's been updated all the way. Uh, per se, a lot of the countries which are there, it doesn't seem to change much, but however, let's look at the other data. The United States, deaths per million, cases per million. Gap Sweden, Sweden, deaths per million, just plummeted again. But you see their mask mandate, they went to a two. It's still been staying there, so I don't know if that's been updated as of yet. Uh, cases per million, look at that, look at that. Brazil, always pretty steady. It It's going down, but man, it was like 12 and a half to 15 per million. That was high. Uh, cases is pretty steady. Uh, the way they do their data and date time, where we discussed that before, it caused this this issue to occur. Japan, pretty much, I know people are worried about the Olympics and stuff like that. Uh, but if you compare Japan to the rest of the world, that's their deaths per million, to just put you in perspective. Uh, Japan, cases per million, it's on its way down. Um, red is your test per thousand. Uh, purple is your cases per million. Going down pretty no matter how they're testing, the cases are going down. New Zealand, that's New Zealand, New Zealand. I know you can barely see it along the x-axis, but you see, there's that. Um, cases, pretty steady, that's pretty much, eh. Finland, 
yeah, there's... Remember when Fauci said, oh, but they're Scandinavian. Like, the the virus knows, like, borders. But there's that. And um, unless he knew about the European genetic variant, I don't know. Uh, let's see. There's that. There's that. And there's your case per million. That's one. India. Again, their deaths per million are probably now... What's the United States deaths per million? Let's look at it real fast. So that's 2.5. And the United States deaths per million is about two. So they're still above the United States. And but they're going dug down. So next week's gonna be a pretty strong determinant. And then India as far as the cases, just dropping just as fast as it rose. A very common pattern. Testing's way up there, cases way down. A really good sign. Spain, pretty much down there. France. That's where you have the 33% vaccine resistance. Remember, there's your deaths per million, about the same as the United States. Cases per million, pretty far down there. And United Kingdom, just look at that. That's just amazing. And Italy, on the way down out of this, they're way down in deaths per million, way down in cases per million. The testing is still high. And the detection of new cases is very low. All right, let's go to hospital occupancy. Um, yeah, this is when we did the no mask states. Remember Mississippi and Montana with no mask for quite some time. Generally, it's like, you know, as far as inpatient beds used for COVID, it's been pretty, fl- I mean, it was the objective was to flatten the curve. You know, Newsom maintaining a state of emergency because the only certainty is uncertainty. I'm pretty certain about that. You know, they're, the curve's been flat. I mean, really, really flat for a long time. I mean, it's been like really flat. If that was their justification rationale for state of emergency, you won. It's done. All right, but let's proceed. Uh, let's look at vaccine distribution. All right, if every state administered vaccines perfectly and there were not bad batches, that's your percentage. But let's go look up here. That's what looking at vaccine delivery was perfect by June 5th, 2021. And there we are. Doo, doo, doo. And there's your percentage of vaccines being distributed per state. If you wanted to get information reference to that, as far as an idea, um, you know, Moderna and Pfizer have always been neck and neck, and then Janssen is kind of like there. And uh, da da da. But there's a vaccine administration per population. Uh, there's Alaska. Remember, there's 85 percent vaccinated, wasn't it? That's Alaska, yeah, eighty-five percent. So, but but on the chart, when you compare it to other states, it's like there. So, and not it's not really. I mean, it is tough to vaccinate. Look at how diverse Alaska is. You administer or to deliver the logistics involved in administering vaccines to let vaccines to that large percentage of the population. How diverse it is 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 pretty amazing overall. Whether you're a fan of the vaccine or not, the logistical coordination is exceptional considering the the, uh, the sparseness of the state of people per acre or a mile, square mile. But the receipt as follows, COVID rebuild. We're not gonna go through too much of this as, at all, as it is. Uh, let's look down to our states. There's our states that I think are still remaining the mask mandates or something like that. It, again, all the states are pretty much looking the same. It's like one giant bell curve. There's Minnesota. I remember when they had the outbreak and they're trying to blame it on the neighboring states that had no mask mandates. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, all, it, no matter what they've done, it doesn't seem to make a difference. That's why the controls are so important. Cases, the hospitalizations. Uh, Michigan. You know, Wisconsin, surrounded by these hot spots, which are Michigan and Minnesota at the time. Just, you know, that's what happened. It was, it stayed untouched. There's that, they're going down. There, there's no consistent pattern when you have controls between states that are strict in their pandemic mitigation uh, regimentation or not. The only thing that tends to be different than states which have a high amount of pandemic restrictions is the hospitalizations tend to be higher. And I don't know if that's confounding because of a psychological issue or not. Um, yeah, they just tend to be higher than the states which are loose. So that's just the way it didn't used to be that way, but starting in January, it did. 
All right, and let's go, that's vaccine effectiveness. And this is the various data. Let's go back to our machine model, uh, Monte Carlo model. Doo -doo -doo. New deaths current in the United States up to the 5th of June. And let's see what the model predicts. That's the model predicts. So as of June 6th, cases per million should be by November 8th below the 10 line. Pretty definitive. Remember, we're not testing new groups like we did last time, which messed with our Monte Carlo model last, last July. We're testing everyone. So it stays on this current path. So if we're going to be accurate by November 8th, yeah, it should be pretty low. To proceed, new deaths per million, Monte Carlo model. I think there's a thousand iterations, for those that understand what I'm talking about. Uh, from June 6th, we're right about here, a little bit about 1.3. By November 8th, it's going to be pretty low if it concurs, whatever reason, if it continues down this path, whatever the mitigation strategy or lack of strategy does or does not. It appears out of a thousand iterations, we have a pretty large gap there, but pretty positive outlook unless something unforeseen occurs if we use certain governors of California's logic per se. Again, all pretty positive, but that's our data for now. Uh, it's it's kind of redundant. I'll start combining the databases just so we could get it on one page. Look at a few states, which are a uh, few countries in the world, which are hot spots, and then basically uh, start edging this on the way out. But as I promised, if you use the Wayback Machine, this is what I was playing with. This is still in the Wayback Machine because I submitted this report a long time ago and this is all I'm not going to click on it for various reasons individuals credit reports yeah you may recognize them right there and uh, this was originally Russian hack but they never deleted it from the uh, Wayback Machine which still has uh, a lot of private information of individuals which should not be on the thing so I use that as my test case because generally all incredibly smart and genius individuals that we have working for our, our illustrious government, a lot of things do get by them. So when I hear when you hear me utilize the words uh, trust, but verify, there's a reason for that. And this is like horrendous security. Uh, this should have been zapped from the way back uh, machine a long time ago, but no, it's still there. You can find it yourself. And it's not that difficult. Anybody can do it. it. Doesn't require any hacking whatsoever. Just use that right there. Type into Wayback Machine and be astounded. It's kind of like you know, just as a side note, just because you know, if you listen this long, the password to the launch the Minuteman missiles. Remember what that was for the past three decades? It was zero 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 zero. And the, the rationale between making the password all zeros was because they figured if it was a panic situation, they wanted to make the password easy so they could launch the missiles in retaliation. But again, let's go back into the information as follows that we covered tonight. Vera's database, still down. No vaccine surveillance whatsoever appears to be going on in the United States for the past, uh, since June 3rd, or sort of June 4th sometime. California Governor Newsom maintaining a state of emergency, which is not healthy for the psyche of individuals which just want this pandemic uh, over uh, because he's certain of uncertainty. Yay, that was a wonderful observation. Yay for him. All right, the Dream Team, incredible combination of medications. Again, I don't care if it's drugs or herbs or nutrients, but wonderful insight. They're still working to solve this problem and may help us with any future problems. Athletic competition in reference to heart cysts, at least as far as observations, doesn't look like cardiac damage is common or maybe not at all in individuals which uh, are athletes that uh, basically do not succumb or basically overcome their mild to light COVID infections. Um, colostrum as a source of uh, virus protection of SARS-CoV-2, that would be really, really cool. Already being tested, no one seems to be really hurt after been taking this colostrum concoction, and it appears that it'll be on the market. 
where, whom, I don't know, but the links will be there just the same. All right, prior COVID-19 infection, again, uh, the observation initially said, ooh, no one has any immune system to it. Again, the immune system is more, far more complex than just antibodies, and obviously T cells can play a role too. But at least from an observational standpoint, yeah, reinfection is pretty low. Uh, if I look statistically, it's even far lower than if individuals that have been vaccinated, vaccinated, <laughs> been evacuated, vaccinated. So that's statistically, numerically, it doesn't mean the vaccine doesn't work. It means from a statistical standpoint, reinfection seems to be much lower in those which are naturally infected as opposed to those that have been inoculated. All right, to proceed as follows, uh, green tea's potential in to uh, help in tackle COVID-19, great, kicks butt on a lot of other famous medications which are out there as we covered per se. Uh, genetic protection, some individuals have very, very strong genetic protection against this particular viral vector, uh, or I should say SARS-CoV-2, um, and that can be actually be tested for. And then if individuals need to be vaccinated, what they're implying is these people probably don't require a vaccine. It should be low priority for vaccine and people without it should be high priority for vaccine if there was an effective vaccine. Again, the week prior to that, not necessarily the first evidence, they're actually the second. First evidence in all due fairness was from Fujita Health University. Then the scientists right here, using traditional Chinese medicine, Chinese medicine, uh, went through a bunch of herbal concoctions, concoctions, and it sounds like a, such a negative term if you say it wrong, concoctions. It is like concocted story, but concoctions. And you can't get much better than basically the Center for Biodefense and Infectious Diseases, as far as credentials are concerned or credibility. And here will be the formula per se, da, 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 as well as protects against many different variants. It gives a great explanation to why many of these uh, herbs per se, tra or traditional Chinese medicine, are utilized and their possible benefits individually and their strength in combination to form the respiratory detox shot. Again, it is now 52 minutes. Thank you all for being there. Gratitude for listening. We'll hope the various system is up by next week because I love to compile the data and see what happened. So chance when the Vera data does come back up, provided that a lot of uh, adverse events are not lost, um, you'll probably see an unnatural spike in data. Uh, but however, though, we'll try to harmonize it. And so we can basically make sure it doesn't look like it's you know panic time on a Monday if it all comes on a Monday of next week. But I'm looking forward to seeing the new data when it does come up. But however, though, in my humble, 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 humble opinion is I do not believe in my personal opinion, uh, vaccine should be continued to be administered when the surveillance system is down. Just in case a bad batch or something like that should happen to occur or other foreseen event, because how are you gonna know? You know what I mean? Again, humble gratitude, thank you, and I look forward to see you all next time. And again, links will all be there for you to follow. And thank you fact checkers for checking the facts and approving the facts that we have because they're facts. But thank you just the same. Catch you all a bit. Bye.